Hey, if you're seeing this, YouTube is being a pain in my backside. Funnily enough, this is the second time in a row that they've taken my first video of the year, demonetized it, and removed it from being searchable. First it was my Mary Sue video, and now it's the Metal Gear Rising video. So like before, I'll be doing a little censoring with this version, but I hope you guys excuse me censoring some of the stuff that YouTube has deemed inappropriate. I suppose with a game with fictional violence isn't okay, meanwhile loads of other disgusting content is a-okay with YouTube. <laughs> It's controlled by something great. Means the DNA of the soul. You know, I'm usually very negative on this channel. You can't really blame me though. Whenever I do things that are positive, most people don't care. But here I am trying to be more positive than usual, and I'm talking about a game that's about eight years old. Truly a great waste of my time. You make me sick, you big baby! But regardless, my editor's being paid, so let's do a small retrospective on this title that I honestly really love. But before that, we need to talk about Kojima, and exactly what happened, or what almost happened to the topic of this video, Metal Gear Rising. Why? Because it's my channel, it's my video, I'm my own master now! <laughs> I don't think I need to tell you guys who Hideo Kojima is. You know, I have to wonder, how do you end up being this stupid? Really? Hideo Kojima? This isn't Genshin Impact. Hideo! Jesus Christ, dude. Get a grip. He's an auteur of video games. Auteur meaning he may as well be one of the few literal filmmakers in the industry. Metal Gear Solid 4 may as well be a goddamn movie. And whether or not you guys like what he brought to the stage with his writing, it's hard to disagree that the guy did make waves in the history of video games. Even to the point that Metal Gear Solid fans got so obsessed that they dropped death threats on MGS4's crew just to get Kojima to come back to it. Now whether or not you like Kojima's works, if you think the guy is a genius, or if you think he's a hack, or you just think he's personally out to get you, or even a mix of all three, his works have influenced the gaming industry to a huge degree. Whether it's for better or for worse is something that I'll leave up to you guys. As for me, while I love some of the titles he's made, they're not my go-to titles when I watch chilling game, with the exception of Metal Gear Solid 3 and also the namesake of this video. The Metal Gear and its more popular sibling, the Solid series, are odd gems of gaming history, all of which had more of a cinematic overtone to the titles, obviously inspired by Kojima's love of film and television, clearly being worn on his sleeves. The practically permanently tattooed on his arms like a prison inmate would wear. Snatcher Hotel has some kick-ass music and some impressive graphics for its time, obviously took inspiration from Blade Runner. Although that opening theme is amazing, and it's clear that Kojima's inspiration comes from John Carpenter. Need only look at the comparison between Snake from Metal Gear Solid and Snake Plissken from Escape from New York and LA to see some inspiration taken from there. Now to clarify, there's nothing wrong with taking inspiration from other works and then jumping it into your own, like how the Persona series took some inspiration from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. I can't prove that, but it's a feeling that I got that happened. Happened. And like I said, Kojima wears his influences on his sleeve, and tattooed on his skin. And again, if that's a bad thing, I'll leave that up to you. But as for Metal Gear, they're pretty influential games. Like, as a gamer, you'd have to be living under a rock to not know about them at the very least. And there's a reason why. You can easily look at Metal Gear Solid 2's odd predictions of our current world. Trivial information is accumulating every second, preserved in all its triteness. Never fading, always accessible. Rumors about petty issues, misinterpretation, slander. All this junk data, preserved in an unfiltered state, growing at an alarming rate. The digital society furthers human flaws and selectively rewards development of convenient half-truths. Just look at the strange juxtapositions of morality around you. Billions spent on new weapons in order to humanely murder other humans. Rights of criminals are given more respect than the privacy of their victims. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! Yep, Kojima predicted the meme-filled cesspit that we have today. 
And there's a lot more than just what we saw in Metal Gear Solid 2. Metal Gear Rising falls into the category as well, but if you were there at the time, you'd know that, well, it almost didn't even happen. I, I thought you were dead. My death was greatly exaggerated. So, big gay. <laughs> So, back in 2009, before Rising was announced, the concept of Raiden, the main character of MGS2 and in Rising, duh, taking the lead role again was hinted at during a secret theater movie that came out in MGS3 Substance. It's called Subsistence, and it was originally shown on the MGS3 official website but then got later ported onto the, uh, you know, subsistence disc. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with why this is important, I'll fill you in. You see, here's the thing you know about Metal Gear Solid and Raiden. At the time of 2, he was a very controversial game character. Oh, he didn't do anything terrible. He didn't say things that would cause people to say he's sexist. Granted, you could probably make a discussion video talking about how the female characters in Kojima's games and how much of a dumpster fire that could possibly be. No, the reason why Raiden was divisive was because he wasn't Solid Snake. Yep, that's it. What a marvelous reason, right? Sarcasm is the lowest form of wit. Gamers really didn't like how you couldn't play a Solid Snake in Metal Gear Solid 2 outside the prologue. And to some degree, I can understand, since Raiden was more or less a character that was more anime-esque. He was sort of a Bashonin, and this was brought on due to a girl telling Kojima that she didn't want to play as a gruff old man like Snake. At least according to TV tropes. And this is something that kind of went against the notion of the previous game which had more of an American vibe to it. So you got a pretty boy with unconventional long hair taking the place of the badass Solid Snake. And thus, most people disregarded Raiden. A lot. Hell, the creators knew about this hate and even made it a joke in Metal Gear Solid 3, with a literal Raiden mask. And you could beat up a character named Rykov in the game who looks just like Raiden and who is one of the antagonist's gay lovers. So, it's a given that there's a bunch of you who really didn't care for the character. Then Metal Gear Solid 4 happened. Look, you want an essay on that game? Go watch Steg Bentley. I'm not touching that one or else this video would become so long that it killed both me and my editor. And I'll say that I agree with Steg that the game really did kick right in the balls and stole his wall in the process. But now we're finally getting to the point in this video. Metal Gear's Rising. It was a game that was planned to be before Metal Gear Solid 4, where we'd follow Raiden in the events leading up to 4's story, and it was going to explain how Raiden went from this... ...to this! I am lightning. Rain transformed. As well as explaining how some characters got to where they were in Part 4. Now, as for why this version of Rising got cancelled... Like, I, I never, like, I never, like, caught on to this as a kid, but remember when Snake gets a call, and then uh, he calls, he, call, he he tells Snake to call him, just call me Deep Throat. And I'm just like, how did I never register that as a kid? Context, why does he tell him to call him Deep Throat? Because, because he like has a, a deep voice, and that's the reason. And I'm just, as a kid playing now, I'm like, that's a cool name. Hideo Kojima, do you know what you're doing, or do you just, like, is your mind just built no, different, he, he man. he definitely planned that out, for sure. <laughs> Yo, Kojima-san. Guess what? The watermelon slicing video? Yeah, it went great. So what's next? game design Yo, dude, look. I don't know how to say this, but I got kids I gotta feed, man. I missed the part where that's my problem. Honestly, there's been no record as to why this version was canned. For all I know, Kojima just didn't want to work on it. There was a secondhand account that he wanted to let the younger developers do this, but went and experienced some complications before Kojima said, FUCK IT, and threw it at Platinum Games. It's weird though, since the script and boss concepts were done, hell, looking at the trailer that was shown off in 2010, a lot of the assets were already in the trailer and it did end up in Rising, like the gorilla-based enemies. The Zandatsu technique was also in the game, and the character Boris, who is obviously Russian, is also in the final product as he was touted in it. But yes, Platinum Games got their hands on the project. Yeah, I got this editor's note that my editor said, make sure you say their names properly. 
<laughs> Thanks, Kaiser. I know you're probably getting tired of me messing up the names. Remember when I said I'd mock the shit out of you for calling Hideo Kojima, Hideo Kojima? Well, guess what? I'm gonna do it again. Why? Because you called Nier Automa, Nier Automata. Wait. Fuck, you have me doing it too. Anyway. <clears throat> Because apparently both Hideki Kamiya and Atsushi Inaba, the heads of Platinum Games, weren't making enough money and Kojima said, and I quote, That's not enough. Come work for me. Huh. Sounds good to me! Platinum Games at the time did have a few killer titles under their belt, and games that I'm sure a fan of, like Mad World or Bayonetta. And also, if you know Hideki Kamiya, then you know the one game that he made that ended up cucking players for like about 10 years. One which he never worked on a sequel on after the first. Devil May Cry. Huh. You know, I'm starting to see a pattern here. Not that these are terrible games, mind you, they have their strengths and weaknesses, but honestly, Platinum Games, even after Rising, have a lot of excellent games under their belt. One of the more recent ones is Astral Change and Nier Automa. With Bayonetta 3 on the way, I can only hope that the studio keeps up with their work. These games have me pretty solid. But enough wasting time and looking at the obvious sexualized content that Platinum Games loves to sneak in, it's time we finally start talking about Metal Gear Rising in and of itself. What the dog doing? Are you, uh, Mr. Raiden, sir? What are you, fucking stupid? To start with, Rising is a completely different beast from the previous Metal Gear games. Not only from a stylistic perspective, but from a core gameplay difference too. Whether you like it or not, Metal Gear Solid has always been, at its core, a stealth action game with cinematic set pieces that more often than not will eat up a ton of your playtime even if you elect to escape the cutscenes. I love the Solid series, but they are the definition of time wasters. If it isn't the key card section where you have to go backtrack in the first game, or the ladder climbing section in Snake Eater, I'm still in a tree, Snake Eater. <sighs> okay, sorry, but even with the theme song playing, that ladder section was ass! Or the entirety that was Metal Gear Solid 4's third chapter that ultimately mainly say, This is BORING! FUCK THIS! And throw my controller into the screen! True story, by the way. Nope, Rising is much more fast-paced, and while there is some stealth elements there, they are more or less taking a backseat to what the game is really about. Absolute steel-fueled carnage, baby! Cause here's the thing, Rising is more of a schlock samurai film with a ton of fast-paced action to complement it. You're already shown that this game isn't meant to be treated like the other Metal Gear games up to this point. Why? Because you're fighting a giant Metal Gear Ray, even to the point where you literally grab its gigantic blade arm, toss it up into the air, and proceed to amputate it like it had an infection. Now, this is a game that, while keeping with the cinematic attributes of the Solid series, incorporates it more or less into the gameplay. Whether you're hopping on top of missiles to attack Metal Gear Ray, cutting Wolf into pieces, slicing up vehicles that Monsoon throws at you, or even as something as simple as the tumbleweed that rolls between Raiden and Jetstream Sam before you actually begin the boss fight. It's beautiful! This game oozes with cinematic experience, and translates it incredibly well to really engulf the player into its world and action. Even some of the slower parts of the game, such as the sewer level, you're still given plenty of things to slice up, and that can ramp up the difficulty to keep the player engaged with the content of the game. Yet another thing to point out is that the comparison to the Solid games, Rising is surprisingly short. You can probably clock in at about 7 hours of playtime, even less if you're playing quickly where you probably power through the game in 4 hours. Hours. Metal Gear Solid 1 takes about 11 hours, MGS 2, 12, MGS 3, 13, and MGS 4 takes about 18 hours. In comparison to those, it's pretty tame in length. Now, I'm not the kind of guy who complains about how long a game is, nor do I equate it to a game's quality. A game can be short, but have a ton of replayability to it. Or a game that's long can be enthralling enough that I can go through it again and again and again. Games like Metroid Dread, Yakuza 0, Persona 4, Ace Attorney, Devil May Cry 5, games of varying length and different gameplay, but all of them I can rarely come back to at the drop of a hat. So, let's talk about the basic plot of Metal Gear Rising. Four.
four years after the events of Metal Gear Solid 4, with the Patriots now out of the picture from the last game, we follow Raiden, who's now under a contract with a private military company that has been making cyborg soldiers for various countries. And as Raiden says, There's a saying I like. One sword keeps another in the sheath. Sometimes the threat of violence alone is a deterrent. And good things never last, like this pants. Of course, considering that we're in a video game at the start, shit's about to hit the wall. You know the moment that things are gonna get crazy is the moment that after you see Jetstream Sam slice a guy into multiple pieces, he turns around and has this shit-eating grin plastered all over his face. And I love it. It immediately sets the tone for the entire game that while the game is obviously gonna be filled with high-octane and badass moments, it also has moments of levity and goofiness. This is what tells me that the game isn't taking itself uber seriously, that it wants its audience to have fun along the ride with Raiden's over the top top actions. While the characters do take the story seriously, the game itself doesn't expect the same of the player, which is what I really like about this game in particular. Yeah, it's got a message about revenge and child soldiers, but they take a backseat to the fun gameplay and funny cinematics. What I'm saying is that the game is actually fun and doesn't make the player feel bad for slicing people into tiny bits and stealing their spines. Grand, I think the story, in my opinion, also tackles another subject, and that's the whole killing of bad guys. Like, there's been a push for people to wonder if it's right or not to kill people in video games. And you know that some idiots will try to take it too far and think it can influence people and they'll use it as a means to demonize video games. And you've got some games that take this concept to the extreme. Now, I know I've railed on this game for ages, but considering that some people still seem to want to defend this game, like this article from this year, yeah, The Last of Us 2's inclusion of this really sucks. Absolutely terrible. Nothing about this is good. Not only the fact that if you kill every NPC, it won't actually affect the story, but it actively hurts it. Considering that the developers made the gameplay actually somewhat decent, if not extremely limited, this creates a weird dynamic that creates a disconnect. It also gets way too laughable that every NPC calls out the names of fallen comrades every time. Then again, I'm of the minds that The Last of Us 2 is a broken plot with a messy structure, and if you show me those awards, I'm just gonna laugh since those awards are chosen by game journalists. People who have for years shown that they can't be trusted sources when it comes to games. Yes, I am aware that killing is bad. I don't need to be lectured about it for 20 hours after I kill a Goomba. And luckily, Metal Gear Rising doesn't do that. Yes, it takes a part of the story and decides to tell the player that mindlessly killing people can be bad, but it justifies it as they made their choices and there will be consequences for those choices. It's basically Karma 101. Probably not the most healthy mindset, but it's a plausible reason. The game can get deep, but it never actively makes the player feel bad for enjoying the fun, but it does make the player think about stuff. Like, from a game designer perspective, while I can appreciate making your player feel negative emotions, that runs the risk of pushing your players away from your title, depending on how you go about introducing these emotions and the way they pay off in the end. Luckily, Rising caps off that spell of despair with a kick-ass boss fight against a guy with magnetic power whose own heart is a nuclear meme reactor. They hide in response to physical trauma. Oh, and seeing a guard play with a cat in the middle of Monsoon lecturing you with the memes is funny and cute. What the dog doing? The story knows when to take itself seriously, but it doesn't also make the player feel bad for playing the game. It's not wagging its finger at the player saying, Killing is bad, okay? I am playing an M-rated game. I would think that would tell me that I'm an adult and I know this basic lesson. Look, Metal Gear Rising doesn't have a story that'll shake you to your core or make you feel bad. But it makes you think. It makes you think about war economy, child soldiers, the ethics of killing, if cyborgs can look good in mariachi outfits, and how reactionary people can be on the internet. And it wraps it all in a very entertaining game. Now I do want to talk more and get into writing as a character, but that's for later in this video. For now, we have to talk about the gameplay. Oh no! Oh no! 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 Papa Vera! What the fuck? This game is so fucking random. So I want to make this clear. I like the gameplay of Rising. For what it is and for the sake of the game, it works well enough. That doesn't mean it's perfect. 
What it does well, it does great, but it does stumble in places that make it not as good as other hack and slashers. First off, Raiden controls great, and if you manage to master the parry system, you'll more often than likely understand how to counter almost every enemy in the game. Oh, and I should note, I only play this game with a controller. Cause real cyborgs play with a gamepad! There was never a time I couldn't play Raiden. He didn't get caught on things, he didn't fall through the world, and he does what the buttons I pressed demanded of him. What I'm saying is that the game does a great job of controlling the cyborg emo badass. And the controls were never a problem and were easy to understand. The simplicity of the combat is both a good thing, but also a bad thing. A good thing because it's one of those games you can pick up and play, albeit you might be a little rusty but can still feel like a badass while playing it. And it's bad because you never really expect too much complexity in the game. Hell, most of the time I stick with the basic katana because it's exactly what you need to fight the bosses and enemies. There's no need to switch to a different weapon that you can get. The moment you get Zandatsu and get the timing right for the parry system, most enemies don't pose a threat to you. And if I'm honest, while I can appreciate that we do get other weapons in the game, there's not really any incentive for me to play with them, and the gameplay doesn't really work too well with that. The main reason is there isn't a quick way to switch between weapons in combat. You have to go into the menu and actively switch weapons or have a secondary weapon equipped, which, honestly, I didn't even bother using a secondary weapon most of the time, and I managed to get some pretty A-OK -okay scores. I feel like this was due in part to the rush development cycle of the game. It had about three to four year development cycle, and I'm being generous since I'm not too sure on the behind the scenes information on the development process. But I would imagine that the passing of the development torches to Platinum may have slowed things down a touch. Now back to the actual gameplay, you can also use things like grenades and missile launchers to fight enemies. But they're in real short supply and force you to stand where you are, which purposely halts the fast gameplay. Honestly, when I was fighting against flying enemies, I just preferred to jump and use the strong attack that allowed me to kick them and slice and dice. But if I'm being honest about any faults, the biggest problem is that I can say the combat and its gameplay are not that deep, just sometimes a bit too much precision is needed at times. This is probably a me thing, but I didn't like how there was such a focus on being precise with your Zandatsu in the final boss. Sure, Sundowner as the boss required that precision as well, but for most of the game you've got the auto-cutting going on for most of the gameplay, and I feel like there should have been more precision cuts necessary during the important battles. You know, I watched a video from a channel called Gaming Brit Show, where he compared Rising with DMC Devil May Cry. Yes, there are things that I do agree with and disagree with in his video, like DMC Devil May Cry had more fluid combat and more complexity in comparison with Rising and simplified their controls. But personally speaking, I prefer Rising because it does a stark contrast to the previous Metal Gear series. It doesn't simplify the original gameplay that Metal Gear Solid had and instead does its own thing unlike DMC Devil May Cry. Mi nombre, por cierto, es Dante. <laughs> Not to mention I actually prefer the art direction of Rising to DMC Devil May Cry. And yes, I will keep saying that name like that because I do not accept this as a Devil May Cry game. Fight me right now, you a Repeat after me. Three, oh, that's two, hot. That's one. Hot. one, two. Hey, wanna see something neat? Uh, Hello, Dante. The Safari! So let's point this out. Milligar Rising is a gritty, dirty game. There's a lot of grays, blacks, and browns used in the backgrounds and in the coloring. Even Raiden's coloring design has very simple colors applied to his overall scheme and has a lot of details to them. And frankly, I like that a lot. Now, I've stated that DMC Devil May Cry has a lot of color to it, but at times, to me, the color was a bit too much, especially when it's incorporated so simply into the combat. Rising, however, uses its color in a more conservative manner, and when color is used, it's used for emphasis. It also helps make the character stand out more from the backgrounds and other enemies. Whether it be Monsoon's bright red armor covering his body, or Sundowner's shields that make him have the appearance of a Shogun or Samurai, or even Jetstream Sam's more tan coloring that goes in contrast with not only him standing the rest of the bad guys as Desperado, but also helps him stand out more from Raiden's design to help incorporate the two characters' positions. Or it can be as simple as Raiden's chin lighting up. Not to mention, when you use your Zondatsu, it bathes the screen most of the time in a blue light that shows that Ryan is focusing on slicing his enemies in two. But now that we've got color out of the way, let's talk about the design of the characters, most notably the bosses. And while there aren't a lot of bosses, their designs are top notch. And while I talk about bosses in a gaming context in a few minutes, I'll say that although the designs of the bosses all have the unique flavors to them, they all still have a uniform connection to each other. Which, when you're trying to enforce that the bosses have a connection of some sort, ends up working really well towards that. 
This also helps with the bosses being very memorable. Even Wolf, who isn't a humanoid, still has his that uniformity aspect to him as he stands out as being the only boss who has a quadruped. I mean, his name says it all. Mistral's got her multiple arms and stands out as the only woman amongst the roster, but still has her own coloring style that matches the others. And I could talk about Armstrong, but that's for later. Point is, I love the art direction and the style that the game has, and it's something that I really enjoy. But you know what else I really enjoy about this game? Music is something. And if I were to describe Metal Gear Rising's music, it's kick ass, it's put in the right places, it's iconic, bosses have their own themes, each boss theme changes when you get closer to the end of their battles with lyrics that describe them as characters through thematic undertones. And unlike a lot of Metal Gear titles, there's a lot of vocal tracks. But I want to talk about three songs in particular that do show off the symbolic aspects the boss fights can have. It can be simple, but sometimes simple is the best way to go about this sort of thing. Let's start with Blade Wolf's theme. <laughs> I'm my own master now, and it certainly fits well since it talks about how Wolf is a caged up beast that's forced to fight for reasons not his own, and while he is allowed to question orders, he can't disobey them. He's a beast on a short chain, and if he fails to follow orders, the only thing that he has to his name, his memories, would be deleted. It's a simple theme, but it fits with Wolf's story before Raiden pieces him back together. After cutting up like a slaughterhouse employee, then we have Jetstream Sam's theme. The only thing I know for real. Sam's theme talks about how he forgot his original reason for why he fought, why he put his heart and soul into his training in swordplay. It should be noted that when you're fighting Jetstream Sam, his lyrical version of the song plays first, unlike the rest of the bosses. It's the signifier that he's going all out against Raiden. However, when you knock his sword from his hands, the lyrics disappear. Because while he fights to know that he's alive, without his blade in his hands, he's unable to fully feel that sensation of being alive. And the last song is the final boss's theme. It has to be this way. Making the mother of all omelets here, Jack. Can't spread over every egg. You're American. You're number one. Nano machine, son. I have a dream. The music for this is not only kick-ass, but it describes how the two men fighting against each other, even though there's little fault of their own and any real reason for fighting, as violence begets violence. It could be interpreted that Raiden and Armstrong understand each other's personal philosophies, but they still clash, because in a way, the same philosophies were reached, but under different motivations and circumstances. It's a strong song that fits the situation. I know I'm no musical expert, and these songs are pretty blunt for trauma when it comes to symbolism, but in that regard, I think it's interesting to look at the music and just see how it applies to the game itself. I don't know, I just like the soundtrack. But now we can talk about the characters they're attached to. Making the mother of all omelets here, Jack. Can't fret over every egg. Personalized. All omelets here, Jack. How f***ing sad is that? F***ing idiot. The bosses of the game are pretty damn good and memorable. There you go. Even the first boss against Metal Gear Ray. After all, the game starts off really strong with a boss that's a literal mechanical giant. And when you think that the game came on too strong, you learn that the smaller bosses are even more dangerous since they have a lot more agility to them and can dish out so much damage. 
LQ84I Wolf is the second boss you face, and while obviously not as big as Ray, he certainly leaves an impression on the player with his entrance and fight, as well as the music that really makes the boss fight memorable. And that's something I can say about the other bosses too. On a presentation level, they certainly do stick into a player's mind with how they're presented and how their fights can be extremely cinematic. There's a lot of playing with the camera angles in the fights, and it certainly does paint pictures that will stay in a person's mind. They aren't perfect though. On a mechanical level, while they are really solid, there are some failures. Like the Desperado grad boss in Mexico level isn't really all that creative or memorable. It doesn't help that the boss comes back as a more standard enemy in the next level. You can say the same thing about Wolf, since there's more common enemies that fight like him, but at the very least, Wolf still has his presentation and music that made him stand out, and these enemies didn't appear until a few levels later. But the biggest issue is when you're in the Desperado building, where you're forced to do a small boss rush where you fight against a copy of Mistral and then a copy of Monsoon, when the previous level had you fight Monsoon already. It feels like a rushed addition to the game where they could have added an original boss here. Granted, I'm not saying they're bad, but they do like the same cinematic punch that they had in the original boss fights. Still, other than those nitpicks, I'd say that each boss has have their own charm and do their jobs really effectively. Don't fuck with this, Senator! <laughs> Even as characters, they stand out despite the small amount of screen time that we get with them. They're not crazy characters. Debatably. But they also have their own personalities and they stick out which makes them unforgettable. Whether it be established desire for revenge against Jetstream Stam for a ride-in, or Monsoon's talk of memes, or the most memeable senator ever to exist, each of the bosses leave their mark in some way. But this wouldn't be enough if the main character didn't also leave his own mark. Good or bad, let's get into it. You make me so angry, editor. Let me kill the past. I hate you. After the Patriots, I thought I could walk off the battlefield and into a normal life. The bit about my sword, that means of justice stuff. But who am I kidding? I was born to kill! I guess I needed something to keep the Ripper in check when I was knee-deep in bodies. You? I'm saying Jack is back. This is my normal. My nature. This is the part of the video that I know is going to cause some controversy. Raiden's character. There have been videos, essays you might say, that talk about Raiden's development in Rising. Some people like it, others... Well, others think it's the worst thing about Raiden's character and that it ruined him. Granted, I can see where people are coming from, but some people say that Rising removes his redemption in Metal Gear Solid 4. I mean, I disagree with that notion, sure, but I see where they're coming from. Now, before you start off by linking me videos that show how it does, or write up your own essay about how I'm wrong and don't understand Raiden as a character, Raiden's character was defined by the fact that he had his choices in life taken away from him. He was a child soldier, forced to kill others at such a young age so he could survive. He was an empty shell of a person. Hell, if you pay attention to some of the codex in Metal Gear Solid 2 with Rose, we learn that Raiden is a pretty messed up individual. It was a representation of how Raiden views himself, a prisoner in his own home. Now, I'm gonna reference Stink Betley's Metal Gear Solid video again, where he brings up the mental health was a new theme in the series. Metal Gear Solid 2 kind of blows that out of the water as we see that Raiden does have some form of PTSD. Honestly, I'm surprised after all that messed up shit he went through, including the stuff he did in his past, that Ryan isn't basically going out into the streets and mowing people down like a redhead at a school on new grounds. I mean, before rising. Raiden was forced and manipulated into being a good American soldier, but the truth is, he's not. He was made to be a tool to Patriots, and funnily enough, they actually did succeed. I mean, Raiden did kill Saul the Snake, who was his adoptive father, slash teacher, slash terrorist, slash murderer of Raiden's parents, as well as being President of the United States, and Snollet Snake's brother, I suppose? Yeah, I know. That's quite a lot, but... We're done explaining his titles. Saw so this was trying to save us from the Patriots. Point is, Raiden was nothing more than an asset for the Patriots. And with how Metal Gear Solid 2 ended, things were bad. Raiden fought because he was placed in a position where he had to fight. 
not just by Solidus and the Patriots, but more metaphorically by the players, who need a protagonist through which they can experience the game. That's Raiden's character. He was used by third parties as a tool and had no control or privacy of his own. In my opinion, the point of Metal Gear Solid 2 for Raiden's character was to break free from the shackles of those who had taken his agency away from him, and for him to not allow his past to control him. Raiden was his own person and wanted to take control of his life, not just from those who would use him, but from the weight of his past actions. Then Metal Gear Solid 4 happened. I don't think Raiden was out of character, but damn did Kojima really beat this poor boy down, along with giving him a plethora of mental issues. Raiden had developed a drinking problem, Rose and Roy basically gaslit Raiden by telling him that his son died before birth, and the two got together for a fake marriage, and Raiden became a full-on cyborg. There's a lot of things that are messed up with Raiden's head, but at least Raiden was in character for Metal Gear Solid 4. I just think it's got a bit too messy for him. Then again, I'm of the mindset that Metal Gear Solid 4 is a bit of a mess. A beautiful mess, but still a mess. And now we get to Rising. And here's something else I need to point out. A lot of this is subjective. I may disagree with people who think that Rising messed up Raiden's character, but I respect their opinions and I'm not calling anyone out on this, so please try to show the same respect that I'm showing. To me, Raiden's character and the Metal Gear Solid and Rising follow this pattern. Metal Gear Solid 2, don't let your past control you. Metal Gear Solid 4, life sucks, you gotta take the reins and fight for what you believe in. And Rising? In Rising, the point is for you to utilize your past. That's the point of Raiden's character in Rising. We learn through Kodak calls that Raiden tried to live a normal life, but things just didn't work out for the cyborg who was a child soldier. People tend to think that life can be easy going and things will work out. That's not always the case. It's probably not the case most of the time either. In Rising, Raiden isn't being controlled by his past. He's using his past to help defeat his foes. He just accepts that the Ripper is a part of him, and not the whole, as someone like Monsoon would have you believe. To me, this acceptance of his past is his personality in a great move on his part and really shows off his character. He's not letting the Ripper define him, he's more or less owning the Ripper. The Ripper was in his past is nothing more than an easy way to say, that's not me, that's not who I am, I did that, but it wasn't me. And that's a psychologically unhealthy way of dealing with trauma. Rising allowed Raiden to accept that he is the Ripper that he's done terrible things in the past, and he can't escape the scars of it, but that also means it conflicts with the redemption that he's earned. He can be the Ripper, but he can be better than the Ripper. He can be a new Ripper. Raiden makes the Ripper a powerful weapon. Oh yes, he makes a powerful weapon. Oh, he's so powerful. So powerful, he makes the cringiest laugh I've ever heard. God damn. Now you're just being nasty. <laughs> God damn you editor. Mango Kamen, fire him. Let me forget the cringe. Do it or I will commit Sudoku in Minecraft while doing a backflip. Instead of the chains that hold him down, he's not defined by it. He's actively defining it himself. I'm not saying it's a perfect interpretation. I'm not saying it was implemented perfectly. And I'd be lying if there wasn't some retconning involved with Rising. I mean, Raiden in Metal Gear Solid 4 wants to be a good father at the end, but then in Rising he says his family understands what he has to do and he leaves him in New Zealand, but... meh. At the end of the day, I just don't think that Rising hurts Raiden's character. If you do think that, more power to you. I really don't care, though, at the moment because I just really like this game. Besides, it makes a really fun romp against Senator Armstrong, who's probably one of the best final bosses in a long time I've had to deal with. Personality, gameplay, and humor is top-notch with him. It's a good character clash between the two, and I'd like to talk more about this game, but my work schedule is similarly clashing with me, so... It's over now. So, Metal Gear Rising. It's a good game. It's really cheap to get on Steam. Get it, enjoy it, or Jack's gonna show up and let it rip. I'm on a common, and remember to examine your fandom. And last but not least, remember that I'm exhausted, and in the words of a certain drinker, Go away now! Adios, amigos. It's not over yet! I want to make this clear, I want to make an entire video dedicated to my favorite American senator with NATO MACHINE SON! But I figured I'd give you guys a small preview on that and talking about how Senator Armstrong is not only my favorite villain from the Metal Gear series, but also how he's a breath of fresh air from the rest of the villains in Metal Gear Solid. Which is amazing since Armstrong doesn't really have that many scenes in the game at all, and yet he's easily one of the most memorable characters in the game. I think it has to do with the fact that Armstrong isn't a philosopher. 
or he's not trying to be one. One of the things I don't like about Metal Gear Solid's villains is that a good portion of the time they try to be very deep characters and monologue all the time. And that honestly gets boring. It doesn't make them interesting, and it really makes the dynamics of the characters really one-sided. I still like the boss from Metal Gear Solid 3, but a good portion of the time she beats up Snake and lectures him. I still maintain that it works for that game, but when it comes to Armstrong, he's practically the only villain to have a back and forth with the protagonist. Raiden's just not being the reactionary to Armstrong, he actively argues with Armstrong and calls him out on his points. Armstrong does deliver his own speech to Ryan at one point, but he does it with flair and entertainment. He's genuinely stolen the show in my opinion. He's probably one of the most entertaining villains I've had the pleasure of fighting in a video game. He's enthralling and has similar elements that of Jetstream Sam, where he doesn't use dirty tricks when you finally force his hand and fight him mano a mano. I don't know, there's just something Yakuza, two older guys just duking it out to the death that just appeals to me as a boss fight. Again, I'm saving a lot of what I want to say about Armstrong for the video dedicated to him, but I will say that I will probably be a rehash later in the Armstrong video, and it's something that I hinted at the Raiden section, and how Raiden and Armstrong are good foils to each other. Ryan's essentially fighting for his beliefs of the right to thrive over the social Darwinism that Armstrong is combating for, and it comes off as a symbolic struggle of the weak against the strong that preys on them. I mean, not many politicians are that THICK! Bah! Ryan is a character who was essentially manipulated for the majority of his life, being nothing more than a puppet on strings for the Patriots and those in charge. It sounds a lot of like the lower class that gets warped by those in higher positions of wealth and power. I mean, everyone, and I mean everyone, has wanted to punch one politician that has done something that made their lives harder. That's something, no matter what leaning you're at, is something everyone has wanted to do. And, well, it amounts to being a useless endeavor. It isn't until Ryan gets Sam's sword delivered by Wolf's sacrifice that he's actually able to properly damage the practically invincible senator. And that's not a single man can change the world, but it has to be a team effort. God, I must sound hammy as all hell. Oh well, making the mother of all omelets here, Jack. Can't fit over every egg. Again, I want to go over more stuff, such as Armstrong as a character, his motivation, his boss fight, and of course... his theme song, because at the end of the day, these are what make him a great final boss. One that is not only memorable to me years after my initial playthrough, but one that is still referenced to this day in some way or another. Fuck all these lunatic liars! And chicken shit bureaucrats! It is over! Oh, thank God.